Kelsey, I've I've been on a lot of podcasts. I've done a lot of interviews, and I'm not just saying this to say it. This is by far the best podcast that I've ever been on. Truly, Let's like, go. like you hold a space that makes it really easy for somebody to just be who they are. And that's a reflection as a testament to you doing your work on yourself. So mm -hmm. from one soul to another, I appreciate you. I salute you for really you doing this work and being who you are. Another banger, another amazing episode, another awesome human who is willing to give us and our listeners their time. Derek Grant is here. Former witch, by the way, when I booked you, I didn't realize former Harlem Globetrotter. Sorry, that's just amazing. Uh, mindset performance coach, author, keynote speaker, thought leader is here to teach us some lessons about life and how we can get through. So thanks for being here, man. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here sharing space and time with you. Yeah, man, you're a big deal. Uh, I, I mean that in like the best possible way. The words that you say, they hit. It matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just I've just realized that we all like we have on the surface, it looks different. Mm -hmm. but We all have something mm -hmm. in the way my mind works. I always tell people I'm a Sagittarius. So like, I need to know, like, it yeah. drives my <laughs> wife up a wall. But like, I need to know why I need to know how. So like I started to look at my own life and realize like, oh, all the baggage, all the issues, all the trauma that I've dealt with, it looks different from her, but she mm. literally is feeling the same thing that I am. How can we break this down in a way that she can understand and he understands and he understands to help us to start really living truly as we are? Oh, which I think is so necessary because there is this idea that, you know, my, it's so funny that you say it that way because my son and I had this conversation this morning, he's seven and he goes, mommy, what does it mean to not judge a book by its cover? And I was like, whoa, deep vibes at 8 a.m., wow. son, let's get <laughs> into it. And so yeah. it's true. We all have something. We all have these experiences in our life that are going to dictate how we view the world and our perception of it. The reality around us is created within our mind of the stories we tell. And that's what I found really amazing about listening to you. I found you on social, like I find actually a lot of my guests and you came into the algorithm in a really positive light at a time where people were very nihilistic and still are, and they're looking at the world in a dark way. And I think when you have people like you who show up and they're in their algorithm, you're starting to, it's like the, the crack in the door, the light can mm. shine through. It always finds its way, you know? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's how it started. I was me, my, my videographer, my marketing guy. We, we, we call us three guys in a basement where we literally <laughs> would just record reels in a basement. And they were, it started off as genuine questions that my marketing guy, he wanted to know, like, how do I get unstuck? I'm struggling with this. And these are the questions that I would ask myself for years, right. yeah. trying to develop a process, trying to develop a system. So maybe at some point I can help somebody else, whether it's my children, whether it's my wife, whether it's the stranger on the road. And we just started filming these reels every Sunday. We try to get 10 done every Sunday. And little did we know that it would get to the point that it's at now. But that's that's why it happens, right? It's meant to happen. It's It doesn't need this massive. I say this so often when people are like, how do I start a podcast? How do I do this? Just start. Just Do start, it, yeah. man. You don't need yeah. over editing. You don't need a massive team. You just need a camera and you need to be willing to be raw and vulnerable and authentic and show up as yourself. And that's, that's it. it. That's, that's it. it. Okay, yeah. let's get into it, man. Like, let's talk about this journey because you clearly have had one. And yeah. uh, I want to know how it started. Where are you from? What was your life like before you became like a guy that was real trick with balls? <laughs> yeah, so... I tell people I moved around a lot. My dad had a job in corporate America, worked for Kraft Food. So mm. grew up eating a lot of macaroni and cheese. Uh, I mean, I grew up all over the place, Louisiana, New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey. So I tell people I'm from New Jersey because I lived okay. there from age 16 to 25. But my formative years were when I lived in Louisiana. So okay. like, that's kind of it in a nutshell. But my, the reason why I say this is because I was able to learn at an early age, oh, people in New Jersey are different in their perspective compared to people in Louisiana. And I was able to see like, oh, wow, we all live in the same country, but everybody views something differently. 
Mm -hmm. And I feel like it cultured me. It allowed me to expand my awareness. I knew what was acceptable in Louisiana versus what maybe what wasn't acceptable in New York. Mm -hmm. And then when I got on the Harlem Globetrotters, you know, I played basketball through college, high school. When I got on the Globetrotters and I traveled to 70 different countries, mm -hmm. I was able to see, oh, wow, we all live in the same world. But people in Argentina, maybe their priorities in life are different than people who live in Dubai. Right. And I started to like reflect on this and like, are we all really, I know there's 8 billion people in this world, but like, or is there 8 billion different worlds? There's mm. 8 billion different perspectives. Oh, we're getting philosophical quick, huh? I'm this is the it. way my mind works. And I started to okay. realize, holy shit, wait, oh my goodness, we're sharing the same room, yeah, but we're having two completely different realities. Yes. And if we can understand that, maybe now it's not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about mm -hmm. me seeing why you view it from this way. And this is kind of how my mind's always been. And this is kind of what set me on a journey to figure out the mind and why people view things the way they do. And then it sent me down this journey of healing when I went through the roughest time I've ever gone through in 2018. Okay. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about that mindset. And then we're going to shift into 2018 because obviously yeah. you can't leave me on a cliffhanger like that. So, <laughs> so that's so, that's so true. That perspective shift is very real. Uh, Americans do, if they're fortunate enough, get an opportunity to live in a country where every state is quite different. Uh, the people are different. The weather is different. The languages are different. Um, the mentality, what's important to some versus others versus the rural areas versus the city. So America's really, really diverse. Yet somehow, American. <laughs> I've said this before, a lot of Americans still believe that like the way they do it is the best and right. uh we've seen that and so we don't have to go down that road but my point is is like for how diverse it is how rich in culture it is especially in areas like louisiana my goodness you've got the french you've got the cajun you've kind of got this huge mix and right. so to see that i'm glad that you were able to pick up on that and i wish that more americans would would lean into the diversity of it. I hate that word now. The diversity of it, because I think it's so important for perspective. But a lot of times people don't see that perspective until they travel the world and realize like, oh, right. we don't eat the same food. We don't do the same things, but yet we're made up the, com the completely the same. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it really, mine was developed kind of out of survival. You think when you're moving mm. around as a kid. Yeah. You got to learn like, what's the social standard in the lunchroom? What's the social standard on the, on the playground? Like, I'm trying to fit in and I realize, oh, because of my skin color, maybe I'm received differently in Louisiana than I am when I'm in New York. And Did I had you to learn kind that? of, a, oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, being, well, how, like I was call, called names that I didn't even, I had never even heard before. I went home and asked my mom, like, what does this mean? And she was like, oh, who in the world oh, called you that? Yeah. Yeah. For real. How old? Sorry, not to like age you, but how old are you now? 41. Okay, so you're not yeah. like crazy far off me, but enough where it's like, yeah, the South is still the South and that never really changed, it feels like. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. it's it's just this way. And when I got on the Globetrotters, I would always, because people would ask, what's, where's the nicest part of America? Oh gosh. I knew based off of like, <laughs> we would have we would have a, a 30 minute autograph session after the game. Right. So people say, hey, sign this, sign this, sign this. And you'd sign it and when you'd give it back to them, mm. did they say thank you? Mm. was it like and I found like I could I could tell you where I was based on how the people would act and it's I mean, I'm not going to get into what what yeah what yeah no, we, I don't think we need to but I think no. you, I, I I think we're going to gather and the listeners who are mostly American are going to gather the vibe so yeah you're good but it's um <laughs> it's fascinating <laughs> my parents are long-haul truck drivers they used to be mm. in the states in the south a lot back and forth and I remember very clearly um the day I cut my hair off and it was a very mm. different response when I went down to the South than when I was with my dad in Canada and how people mm. would perceive that it was very yeah. different dynamic, but I think it highlights the, the, again, the stories we tell ourselves are based on the reality that we've lived and all of us have lived, whether we like it or not, some form of trauma, some form of exposure to something that was either uncomfortable, unnecessary, unneeded, or just because the parents were never taught any better. Right. Yeah, right. that's it. Yeah. So 2018 sounds like it was rough. So why don't we lean into that? Yeah. So I have to, I have to preface it with this because yeah. there's a, 
just from what I do now for a living, like there's a lot of people who do this and don't realize. Mm. I thought that if I had a certain amount of money, mm. if I drove a certain car, if my house was a certain square footage, then I would be enough. And I didn't realize this prior to 2018. Mm. So which caused me to get in business relationships, Got it. seeking things for the wrong reason. Mm. Oh, let me get involved with him. Yeah, we can have these business deals and we'll do the X, Y, and Z and make this much money. Ignoring the fact that there's red flags. Ah, this guy I... seems shady. This guy seems a little bit uh, not high character. So I ended up getting involved with a business partner who we were living in Indiana at the time and said, hey, let's move down to Florida. We have this business opportunity. We can you know, do X, Y, and Z. I'm like, okay, cool. Convince my wife. We moved down there with our family, two little kids. I think my kids were five and three at the time. Okay. And we moved down there and I mean, things went to hell in a handbasket like that. I mean, we were victims of fraud, stole money, stole cars, ruined our credit. I mean, like when I tell you we lost everything, oh. wiped out our retirement, we lost everything. 365 days later, we moved back to Indiana. I have to move in with our in-laws. We can't buy a house because our credit's ruined because of this. Right. And I'm at the lowest of the low. And I have to say this, and I know this is sometimes sensitive people, but like, I always make sure let people know that I'm never speaking from something I read in a book. It's from experience. Mm -hmm. I said to myself, I can't do this anymore. If this is what mm -hmm. life is. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And mm -hmm. I sat down to write a note to my family. And brought to you by Mindful Meds. You guys have been seeing me take Mindful Meds for a little while now. Mindful Meds is a premium supplement company dedicated to supplying humans with the tools to improve their mental health, clarity, and performance, all while supporting their growth along the way. Whether it's the Immunity Blend, Lion's Mane, Inspire, or Voyage, all of their products are clean, tested, consistent, and they've become a huge help in my life. I found Mindful Meds over a year ago now, and I've never looked back. Go check out their website, mindfulmeds.io, and use the code BRASS at checkout. And I had the vision of my, at the time, my six-year-old son, how much shame he felt and how much embarrassment he felt knowing that his dad gave up on him. Mm. And it was enough to like shake me and get through that day. And the next morning I woke up, I heard like this voice. I had this thought, this feeling say, you got to change the way you look at it. Mm. Change the way you look at it. Subsequently that day, I got a knock on the door and it was the FBI. What? And the, F the FBI oh. comes to my house and they're like, hey, we're so-and-so with the FBI. We're not here after you, but we know you were involved with somebody who we've been chasing for five years. Shut up. No. And I'm like, now I'm walking around with two cell phones, a fake email address. I have to meet the FBI in an undisclosed location so they can pay me every week, sign a piece of paper that has a my code name on it, which was Crossbow. I tell people that's Yes, like it was. <laughs> yeah. But like, I'm like, I'm a basketball player. Like, how did I get to this point? Like, I'm just a regular guy. And I'm like, my life is in shambles. And I'm like, I got to do something because of my quality of life right now. Me and my wife are arguing every day because she's like, this was your business partner. This was your like, and now yeah. we're like, so I say that because 2018, 2019, and then 2020 happens, right? Mm -hmm. COVID happens. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, I got time now to figure out and get my life in order. And I just went down a rabbit hole and I haven't been out since. And here we are. I've just understanding the mind, understanding our psyche spiritually, like how we operate, what we are. And this is how I got to where I am today. Damn, you became an operative for the feds, huh? <laughs> I was an op, yeah. <laughs> Who, whoever thought that little boy in Louisiana would become Man. an operative for the white feds? It's, I, it, I, I tell you what, it's not as dramatic as they make it on TV, but it's. I know those boys. It can be if they want it to be. It can be. At least for me, it was. I was involved in white collar crime, so I was. I was good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, I didn't see that story turning so aggressively. Yeah. But oh my goodness! Okay, so we worked for the feds. We've understood that. Um, <laughs> damn. Well, look, man, that's a vibe. That's a whole. That's a hole to dig out of. But I think what really is beautiful about that is that you were able to shift the perspective that life is happening for me and not to me. Yeah. 
it was my responsibility though. So my 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 mom, my mom and dad, they grew up in rural South Carolina, dirt broke. Like accountability was their thing. Like mm. we're going to be accountable. If we're not doing what we're supposed to, we're going to say we're not doing what we're supposed to. Mm. So for me growing up, accountability was love. Love was accountability. So I always had a foundation and it never was like, oh no, what's going to happen? It was like, okay, what do I have to change within me so we can rectify this situation? And that's like, that's really what got me out of the whole thing was me right. looking at myself saying, okay, he didn't do this to you. You did this to yourself because, mm. and when you take accountability, now you can start the process of healing, start the process of rectifying what you have within you that needed to be reconciled. Mm. And that's kind of the name of the game now. That opportunity for growth presented itself and you were able to see it as that. As exactly. Of, we have so many people that have these things happen to them and they look at it as like, poor me, why me, why me, why me? This had nothing to do with you. This wasn't about no. you. This was right. about the person that took advantage of the situation. And because sure. you were so blinded by this idea of materialistic comfort and this idea that X, Y, and Z must mean I'll be happy instead of finding the happiness in where you were, we ignore right. our own intuition. We ignore what it means to be a human that kept us alive on the plains. Like we, that has right. kind of been beaten out of us a little in, in these yeah. like, weird little uh, societal rules and behaviors that we have to adhere to. And we were, we were talking about this right before the show about my hand tattoos. And it, that's one of those things for me. It's like this societal norm. I was told my whole life that if I had tattoos, I was going to be a loser. No one was going to hire me. I wasn't going to be welcomed into normal society. I couldn't get a job at fucking Tim Hortons. That's like Starbucks, but like. Tim Hortons is awesome, by the way. Sorry. No, it's ahead. not. Don't talk what? good about For that. For an place. American. Oh. Tim Hortons is. I used to love going to Canada with the Globe Charters because it was Tim Hortons, those Tim bits. Sorry, I just had to go there. But go ahead. I can't, okay. <laughs> I worked for years in high school at Tim Hortons. And I will tell you right now, that is garbage food don't put it in your body <laughs> is an inflammatory Not anymore, but for sure <laughs> yeah i feel you so it's like this idea that we can be better if we just change how we view it and that change is really difficult that mindset shift mm -hmm. takes significant amounts of effort and that's why so many people don't dive in to this this rabbit hole or this pool or this edge or whatever you want to call it because it's so overwhelming so yeah. when you talk about suicide our show, that is a regular topic. Uh, it sure. is a it's a comfortable topic. And the reason I say it's comfortable is because I've been there. I was there for years. So many of my friends, we lose 44 a day in the United States to mm -hmm. veteran suicide. So it has become a, a topic that I, I talk about intentionally because when you keep things in the dark, that's sure. where they grow. You Absolutely. have to bring all of these things out into the light so that there is no shame, that there is no uh, dark feeling toward it and understanding that suicide is an impulse and it comes from a lack of feeling purpose, a lack of mm. feeling connected, a lack of feeling um, supported and loved. And that can all be fixed when you bring these things to the light. So thank you for sure. being willing to talk about that. No, of course. When you got to that point and you started to shift your mindset and you were like, I'm going to do something different. What was the first actionable thing you did could you remember Man, was it, it so was many? so <laughs> it was so hard but like i would go sit i would hire a babysitter mind you i was unemployed i had no money like i would scrounge up money to get a babysitter to go sit out in the woods i would go get a chair i get a, a notebook and a piece of, and a pen and i would write down everything that i was afraid of mm. i was i would write down all of my fears all of my insecurities and this was before, like, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just like trying to bring to light all of these holes within me. Mm. And that's when like everything changed because I, I, you know, I talked about accountability. You said like what's in the dark grows, but essentially I was shining my flashlight of awareness on all these dark pockets. And a lot of us, like, that's, what's painful. That's what's hard because I have to look at myself and be like, yeah, I do feel insecure. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I'm enough. I didn't feel like I got dad's approval growing up. Like, that's a hard pill to swallow. But if you can face your demons and learn their names, they'll stop chasing you. They'll mm. stop. Mm. Unless you're David Goggins and you increase that. Oh, <laughs> that's a vibe, man. Um, okay. So you, you started to shine onto the shadow self and you started to really pull apart this idea of approval, this self-worth, this self-love. 
What was the yeah. next steps in developing it? Obviously, bringing anything to the awareness is how you start and initiate the change. So you've now sure. brought it to the awareness and the conscious mind. What does that look like moving forward? And how does your wife perceive this? Uh, she, she, I mean, it was rough. She, she even told me, she's like, this isn't the man who I married. Mm. Who are you? Like, oh. you're changing. And it was, you know, that's, that's like the biggest fear that every human being has is not being accepted, mm. which was like, I realized this was like my lesson for me to start learning how to accept myself without conditions. But the way everything works in this universe, it operates in opposites. So I have to first learn what it's like not to be accepted. And that will create an imbalance in me, which will force me to start this journey of figuring out who I am so I can start to accept myself. So I first had to acknowledge what was going on, right? Being awareness to it. Then it was accepting. Yeah, this is how you feel. And this is what happened. You did deal with abuse. You did deal with trauma. But you know what? That was just a situation that you formed a perspective around mm. and you have this superpower of perspective that you can shift it if you have, if you're willing to. And that's when I was able to start meeting it with compassion. I was able to like, look at myself and say like, you know what? I love you. I love that eight year old or that nine year old who maybe wasn't accepted by his peers because of the color of his skin, because of the way he was, you know, their parents raised them, but I love you. And that's all he was looking for anyway. He wasn't looking for dad's acceptance. He wasn't looking for mom's. He was looking for his own. So this is the journey. This is the battle that, you know, a lot of us don't realize, but this is the journey. It was you versus you. It's always you versus you because there's no one else there. That's the other thing. These are just, this is just the reality we choose to live in. You can yeah. shift that reality. You can shift that dynamic. You can make it what you want it to be. There's a lot of people out there, they, they they use the words manifesting, scripting, you know, visualization, whatever term resonates with you. As long as you're doing the work and you're putting the effort in, it's going to shift. You just got to show up. That's it. Just got to keep on <sighs> swimming. That's it. That's, oh, again, another fucking Navy SEAL reference. <laughs> I thought we were going to go one episode without it, but apparently well, not. I, I, I meant swimming as in Dorian and... Uh, <laughs> uh what is it uh what's it finding nemo finding yeah, nemo yeah, finding... oh yeah yeah just keep finding swimming nemo. just keep swimming yeah i say right after goggins we're really gonna lean in huh are we uh no 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 the no swimming. no, no okay. david goggins here <laughs> okay yeah you're not the vibe and i, I think no. I, say that, I say that in a healthy way um i i like the idea of you know of facing your demons and and making friends with them to an extent because i think at some point you're gonna have to stop running and you're, you're to. going to have yeah. to face whatever it is that's in there and have those hard conversations. But if you can get to know who that demon is, you can actually use that and teach it when it's acceptable to come out rather than killing the ego. Because I don't right. believe in killing an ego. I think, and I've seen in, in life-threatening situations where that steps forward when the rest of you can't. Right. Yeah. That's, I think it's necessary. Maybe, I always say like, Maybe we don't think of the ego as the enemy or like something bad, because if we do that, that's actually the ego judging itself. Mm. How about we think of it as that's a, it's a tool. It's like a car. Mm. Car's great if you have awareness and know how to use it, but if you don't know how to use it, it can become a weapon. Right. So the ego and, and everything else in our mind, the demons, they're not necessarily here to hurt you. Maybe they're here to teach you, mm. but you though have to go on a quest you have to ask the questions so you can gather the information and then you'll see what the demons were trying to do. They were trying to actually tell you something within yourself. Right. And you've reinvented yourself, man. You've really taken the ball and run with this. No pun intended, but like, let's, I didn't even mean that. That was, I didn't even that was, mean that. Was that. Nice. that was, I know <laughs> I'm getting good at this. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's talk some more about your, your speaking, because I think when people get opportunities to hear others who have been through real life traumas, real life experiences, perspective shifts, they're more open to the words that have that come from that individual. And so yeah. if you've gone from being a, a globetrotter, you've been on large stages, you've been in the limelight before, how is that transition in terms of imposter syndrome and self-love and self-worth going into speaker roles and author roles? Yeah, I've always... I've never struggled with imposter syndrome 
outside of like like out in the world right i've always had a, a huge imagination like i was the kid who had imaginary friends and would talk to himself like that was me so i've never had a problem with seeing myself as maybe more than what i am right now wow. i could always like convince myself no you can do this so my a little background on me nobody in my family played basketball i'm six foot two my mom's five eight my dad's five seven my brother's five ten <laughs> Like I'm a giant in my household and nobody has any athletic background. Oh, I love it. But I always knew in my mind, like, dude, you can do anything. Like I have this inherent knowing, like there's nothing you can do. And sorry, there's nothing you can't do. But over time I started to lose that. And I started to realize where my imposter syndrome would come up would be in this notion of being a father, this notion of being a husband, like in the house, is where it's like, I don't feel worthy. Why? It's because of the lack of self-love and maybe the lack of emotional connection that I looked for when I was growing up that maybe mm. I didn't get. And now it's like, I don't feel worthy of even having this love in this house. I don't even feel worthy. So it's weird. Like a lot of people that I deal with imposter syndrome exists out there. But for me, usually it's like within the four walls of the home. Okay. So talk to me about that. Talk to me about how you cope with that. What lessons and tools you've got? Yeah, so I, I realized that if I don't feel as though I'm worthy or capable of being, you know, a good father or a good husband, or it's not actually the act of being a husband or being a father. Those are the that's the outside world showing me within where pockets of me don't accept myself, pockets of me don't love myself. So my job, my responsibility, and I do this every morning. I call it a mental emotional audit where. I go through my own life, my own mind and see, are there any places where you do have fear? You do feel insecure. You do feel unworthy, whether it's in parenting my son's basketball or coaching my son's basketball team or being a husband. I'm looking for any place to lead me back to where the wound actually originated. Mm -hmm. And this is this is really what authenticity is. People think authentic means to be like, oh, this is who I am. No, authentic, something that's authentic, you know the origin of it. Uh, so when I know the origin of where the wound began, now, once I patch that and reparent and self-parent and give that version of me what it needed, then this version of me today at 41 will become more whole and won't feel like it doesn't belong or feels like it's unworthy. Oh, I love that. I really love that. And I think a lot of people struggle with self-worth and self-love right now. I've never seen That's... so many moral wounds. There is, well, first of all, I don't want to get too much into it. The way the system is set up, and I say Please system nature. Get right? as far <laughs> into it as you okay. would like. Okay, okay. So the system is set up yeah. to keep you yeah. in an autonomous state, unconscious state. So the only way to do that is to put you in lower vibrations of fear, of guilt, of shame. So... Now, when I go to school and there's a grading system that has failure, the mm -hmm. moment that I come close to it, what am I going to feel? I'm not going to feel proud of myself. I'm going to feel shame. If you look at religion, it's going to induce that you're born a sinner. You're, it's shame, fear, guilt, shame, fear, guilt, shame. And it keeps you in a lower vibration. So now, guess what? You really think that you are unworthy, but the reality of it is, is your self-worth was already at 100. There was nothing you could do to become more worthy or less worthy. You just had to realize it. And I mean, the matrix is set up perfect to keep you from being able to see it because it puts a bunch of things in front of you so you can't, so. No, I yeah. love that. I'm glad, okay, because so many people hear me preach about it. So it's really nice to know that there's other people saying it the way you're saying it because that's what happens, right? That's what's yeah. currently happening in my totalitarian nightmare is that when we we wonder why people can't shift perspective and work on themselves it's because we are so inundated with fear and hate and heaviness and expenses and and rising costs and just like trying to keep food on the table and keeping our fucking family safe and just being a human being on this face of this earth, the the powers that be wherever you are have gotten real strategic at this is how we get a person to do what we want. So yeah. wherever you are, that's happening. And no wonder people don't have the extra capacity. Most people 
are right at their rev limiter, right? Like that was a mm. motocross term there, where they're they're just <laughs> ah, rah, rah, they can't go any further because there's nothing left to give. And when you're yeah. just that term pouring from an empty cup, whatever you want to use, people have nothing left. And they are so beaten down. They are so broken. They truly believe that they're never going to get to where they want to go. Their families are always going to struggle. And it's because we've been slow dripped into oblivion, into this idea yeah. that this is just what life is supposed to feel like. Right. That was the question I asked myself, Kelsey, when I, when I kind of came to, I was like, this can't be what life is like. If, if no this way. is what it's a, like, there's no, like, cause I look at, like, I look at my dog, I look at the, the squirrels, I look at a deer, like they don't seem like they're suffering. Oh, right. But they're also not plugged up to this matrix because they don't have the mental faculties that we have. Right. Can I unplug? How do I unplug? Mm. What are the, like, where am I being held? Where's my leash? And that's when I really started to dive into what the mind is. When I tell you it was an epiphany, I was like, holy sh like tell me. Like we're literally being brainwashed. Yeah. Like from the before you came out of the womb. Be yeah. long before you came out. Like Hey humans, I know you've all been seeing me drink HVMN's ketone IQ lately. This is a game changer. Jet fuel in a bottle. I use ketone IQ for everything in my life, whether it's running, cycling, podcasting, or just the extra boost that my brain needs. I won't lie, it helps push me to the next level in all things. I love Ketone IQ and what HVMN stands for. Go grab some shots today at HVMN.com and use the code BRASS20 and save. It is, so now I sit back, I don't, you know, I don't watch the news, but like when I go visit my parents, they'll have the news on and I'll just sit here like in awe watching. It's dumbfounding, it. isn't it? I'm like, what the, f like. How? You can swear on the show. It's all good. Okay, I just uh, swear. I, yeah. Oh no, you can super swear on this show. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I know I'm one of those. Um, it's it's kind of uh when you watch the news for the first time. So one of my biggest things, and I'm a I I I, I scream about this everywhere I go. People are like, Kelsey, how do you make change? It's like turn off the fucking news. It's not yeah. hard. The second yeah. you remove, you unplug from that system of the constant fear-based mentality, that constant, always heightened nervous system, sympathetic mind, nervous systems racing, need medication to bring it back down instead of just teaching breath and yoga and mindfulness in schools. The second you watch it again, and even in a passing by, I won't lie. I get that stereotypical trigger like response sure. where I was in the CNN building for an interview last year and I was mm. watching the episode prior to me going, I know that to be a lie. Mm. I know that factually. It was a thing about Ukraine. I had a friend on the ground who was like, that's not happening. And I'm like, but, wow. but, but they're saying it. And they're like, I know. And I'm like, you know, these are the moments where you, you look back, where you look back at footage of, of uh, Iraq or Afghanistan, for me at least, and you look back at the news and I'm like, oh my God, no wonder all of us joined. Mm. Oh, no wow. wonder. Yeah. It's so when you start to pull back the fabrics of your reality and you're willing yeah. to see why you've made decisions and what that decision looked like and how it had a catalyst point to the rest of your existence. It's like, okay, no wonder people are so afraid. They truly believe that in 20 years, there's going to be no more earth in, yeah. in 30 years, there's, there's going to be no more food because of cows. Yeah. Like it's Thanks. like, nuts man it is it is and it's it's, it's yeah and people don't realize like you're creating your reality yep. like so not necessarily like okay if i'm looking at your book right and i was like man this book is great i'm not actually experiencing your book that's not what i'm right. experiencing i'm experiencing my perspective of the book mm. but where the power comes in is when I can control and influence your perspective based on how I want you to experience it. Mm -hmm. And this is where people don't realize it's like, you're literally creating someone else's reality because you don't understand how your mind works. Mm -hmm. If you knew what I knew, if you knew what you knew, you could literally create anything that you want because mm -hmm. you were in your own individual universe. And that's 
That's where the power is. And if you look at everything, it's designed to keep you from realizing this. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk to you about this and I, I haven't heard you talk about it. So if you're like, I, this isn't a lane I'd like to go down, you stop me dead in my tracks. No, I'm, I pretty much talk about anything. Yeah. Yeah. I'll talk about anything. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> I know, man, when I'm picking guests for the show, I look at stuff and I go, where can I push? Where can I push? Because yeah. a lot of times we get, you hear podcasts. Like I, I say this a lot. Everyone has a podcast. Not everybody have, should, should have a podcast. I'm okay with saying that. And <laughs> I think that when you can have really raw conversations, that's really where like that growth, that like, oh, that moment, that spark, that hit for someone is going to be. And so I want to know your view, speaking of perception, universe, yeah. the way we see the world. How do you feel about psychedelics? Ah, ah. Um, I, okay. So I can always speak on what I've experienced. Okay. Um, psychedelics for me personally have been an unbelievable tool yes. to help me get deeper than maybe I could have within a specific time frame. So like mm. I'm actually leaving here in six weeks to go down to Mexico for an ayahuasca retreat. I like, yes. I'm having my own ayahuasca retreat here in June. So like, I know the power of psychedelics mm. as long as the intention to use them as a tool and not as a vice. That's, that's my stand. I'm, I'm, I am pro psychedelics. If you're using them for what they were intended to be used for. Ooh, which that's is really interesting. The healing journey, right? Getting, getting deeper into who you are. Cause think about it. We use ayahuasca. It's the plant of one. It's the leaves off of one plant and the root off of another plant. Mm hmm why in the world and who thought to mix these together to be able to do you know the story you, about it i don't know the origin of how like one person realized this and then this like okay do you want to know yeah, yes yes i'm going to reverberate what i was told by the shipibo tribe when i was in peru okay okay so the shakruna leaf and the eye of vine grow in very separate places in the jungle and i'm going to butcher the living hell out of this so the as the story goes is there was a female who was taking a bath in tobacco leaves and tobacco mm -hmm. is also a master plant. And so because we, as a female, the uh, the vaginal glands are very absorbent, it, she got this huge, huge psychedelic experience. And that's mm -hmm. where I came to her and said, now this is what I was told. So just go with me, but this is, sure, you sure. can double check this, but, and she was had this vision and had this conversation where she was supposed to go and take this leaf and go and take this plant and brew them together. <sighs> And it was going to be the key to unlocking, you know, this healing. So mm -hmm. the medicine in itself is always, I, I love it because I, I got the opportunity to, to do uh, the first regulated macro dose in Canada last mm -hmm. year and wow. of psilocybin. And the conversation's really funny because you dance around the, should pharmaceutical companies have this? Are they going to do what they always do with it? Right. And then you realize that, these medicines are so much more powerful than you realize. And they laugh and they show you like, no, 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 no. We know how to motivate a human and we need to get out into the world to heal people. So the way we motivate yeah. is with money. So we know what we're doing. Trust in us. Right. Trust in us. And it is right. this really profound, really profound experience. Once you start to see how the medicine makes its way into the world and mm. how it can be used as the tool and I love that you said that with such intent because a lot of people will skip the therapy, skip the hard work and just go, I'm gonna go sit with ayahuasca and, and have no integration, which right. is the most, God, I hate friggin' Zoom, <laughs> the <laughs> most important uh, portion of the medicine journey and intention. Right. And so what is it that you have found going down that path, going down that journey that has helped strengthen the connection to self and yeah. open up your mind in a way that's allowed even more perspective shift. Yeah. So the first, my first plant ceremony was psil psilocybin and it was weird because I had this, whatever word you want to use, but like I was having a conversation with this, the all the God mm -hmm. source, whatever you want. And I asked it, what is the most important thing in this reality? And before I could finish asking it, it said love. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, okay, cool. Love. 
Fast forward six months later, I ask, I go back into another ceremony of psilocybin and I ask like, what is love? And then I've, I'm told what love is. Love is the thing that encapsulates everything. It's not this human, oh, I love you. No, it's really what it comes down to. It's self-acceptance. Mm -hmm. And then it goes to tell me the most important love of all is the love of yourself because that's all that existed. It was just you. So once you fully accept yourself, you now usher in love because that's all you were was love. Love was not a verb. It was a noun. So my like, and I can go deeper into stuff, but like. Go as deep as you okay. want. This so is like, for you. Yeah, no, I, I'll tell you, like, there's no such thing as death. There's no such thing. Like, there's absolutely like, like, it was literally like telling me. Cause I'm like, what, like my body's shutting off. Like my body was shutting off in waves. And it's like, this is what you would refer to as death. This is what it feels like. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm still aware. I'm still alive. And it's like, that's because nothing ever dies. Your awareness is always there, even without the body. So that was like freeing. I'm like, what the f like, <laughs> there is no death. What the fuck? Like what? So now that I know that there's no death, I can live. I can really live now. Like, I know, the, like, you know, you know the saying, like when you I know that you die, you're going to die, you, you, that's when you start living. Like, mm -hmm. now I know what love is. I know the battle. I know the journey is for me to accept me just as I am, regardless. And first though, I had to know what I was. And that's where plant medicine helped because I was able right. to see, I'm not in this fucking body. I'm not this, I'm not this skin. I'm not, I'm none of these things. I'm something that you cannot fully articulate. Right. Yeah. Powerful stuff. Man, we don't have the language to articulate it. There's no words. There's no words. No. Yeah. This is oh, cool. <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> I'm really excited to hear about your journey uh, when you uh, go again here soon. Have you sat with Aya yet or just psilocybin? So I so this is how I am, okay? Okay. So I I I did psilocybin, right? I've done that multiple times. I did Aya by myself. Oh, okay. It for eight hours. Oh no. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So I've had that experience by myself, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go down this route with a shot with a shaman. Like I would, cause I want to have like the real experience that everybody like. So yeah. Okay. We're yes going to talk after. We're going to talk after. Oh my goodness yeah, gracious. Don't yeah. for, for disclaimer. That is do not, not the way do, to do it. Do, that is not the way, but I will tell you this, Kelsey, like only because I know myself and I've seen my past lives. This is my first rodeo. Mm. Like one of my past lives, I was a shaman. So like, that's why I didn't have a fear because my spiritual coach, she was like, I wouldn't do this. And I actually brewed it the year before okay. and something in told something inside said, do not do this. Do not. So I kept it in like a container for, I don't know, two weeks. I was sick for those two weeks. The day that I poured it out and threw it out, I'm fine. I'm good. And it was like, energetically, you're not ready for this. You're not, you are not in a place. Your awareness cannot handle this right now. Like this is your mind trying to do this because you think this is what you're supposed to do. But the heart was like, no, 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 no. So I definitely don't, I do not advise people to do that. Like get a shaman, go on a retreat, whatever you need to do. But yeah, that was my first experience with it. Yeah, the thing about medicine and the saying goes, right? The second you say yes to the medicine, it already starts working. Right. right? Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. The medicine just wasn't saying yes to you, son. That's how that works. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, hell no. I'm not right. going there. It, it didn't let me know. <laughs> it will let you know. It will yes. for sure let you know. I, I'm very excited to hear about that after. So we're going to follow up on that because I think that I'm, I'm really curious to see how you're going to feel after the Icaros have been saying over you and the prayers have been solidified and you've done multiple days with her. I think it's going to be really profound. I, I want to shift gears a little because... I, I, I've heard other people say this, and I, I'm curious to what it means to you. Because I would never call myself this. I'm more of a, I would say, advocate or very loud human, but thought leader. Hmm. Thought leader. What does the term thought leader mean to you? Um, yeah, probably the easiest way to articulate it is... I'm not here to lead your thoughts. 
Mm. Thought leader is like singular. It's me. Like I'm making sure that I am aware of what I'm thinking and what's mm. going in. So people think when I say thought leader, like I'm leading everybody. What? No, 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 no. I'm actually talking about me. Like mm. I am the thought leader as opposed to for so long, other people were my thought leader. Other people were like conditioning how I think, how I perceive things. So in a nutshell, I'm talking about me, but if somebody were to like, how does this relate to me? It's essentially showing you how you form your own leadership with your own mind, mm -hmm. how you become the captain of your own ship. It's not someone else. It's not the government. It's not your parents. It's not your spouse. You can start to think and perceive, thus creating your reality as you want to experience it for yourself. So that's what thought leader for me in a nutshell is. Mm, I like that. That's really intriguing. I was very curious about that. I was I was really yeah. excited to hear that. That's a great answer. You're actually the first person who's ever asked that. That's a great question. Yeah, I have a tendency to do those. <laughs> I don't know, man. Let's uh, <laughs> let's dive into uh, it's a little bit of a darker place, but I think your light will be really welcomed on it. We've got this world. You have no idea where I'm going. That's why I, I love no that. I'm, I I'm know, willing. right? <laughs> You're like, oh, this could go so <laughs> wrong. I want to talk about what's going on in the world in terms of this mental health epidemic, addiction-based life of just trauma and sadness and heaviness and really where you're at with it and how you, if you have a viewpoint on how we heal and what that could look like, because so many people are in this state of helplessness to the truest extent of what that means. Yeah. I think first we have to understand really the nature of what we are. You're pure, right? So like you're not broken. You're actually not able to perceive your wholeness right now. There's a big difference. There's a big difference. So now that if we, if we can fundamentally understand that, it's really the journey of removing and releasing all of the things that I have acquired in this lifetime that psychologically have disillusioned or got me to believe mm -hmm. that I'm something other than what I really am. My issue with this whole mental health movement is, as with most things, mainstream gets a hold of it, and now we yeah. talk around it. We talk about it. That's not a fuck enough. That's not it. That isn't how we, like, I'm saying... I tell people all the time, I don't hear anything about mental health. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to hear about it. It's almost like playing video games and like, oh, look at me. I'm in the NBA. No, that's not being in the NBA. That's not it. Right. If you want to fix mental health, abuse, addiction, all of these things, we can provide resources to tell people where they put their shovels. But ultimately, the individual must make the choice themselves to put the shovel in the ground. And sometimes that's really hard. And for me personally and what I do, I always tell people, I'm not here to do it for you. I just show you what you have to do and I will walk by your side, but you have to do the work. And I just actually, I had a client I was working with who struggled with addiction. And the epiphany was their addiction to alcohol was really because they had never processed when their mom died when they were young. Mm. So they're just using alcohol or, or if it's porn or if it's drugs, whatever it is, it's just a numbing device right? because there's something inside of you that just needs to be reconciled so you can see yourself just a little bit more as you are. Mm -hmm. If we start teaching that, I don't, I mean, I don't know what the, I think the world would look a little bit differently. Yeah. It's an inside job. It is. Everything is an inside job when you look at it. It always comes back to you, always. It will always come back to you, always. And if so we can accept that, Kelsey, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, like, no, 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 please go. Like, this is, I'm very passionate about this, like giving people their power back of realizing like, no, it can't be the situation. Mm -hmm. It can't be, because if you go to sleep or we shift our perspective, you experience the situation completely differently. Mm -hmm. You have the power, but you have to realize why this situation is coming up. It's literally just trying to get you back to an unconscious part of yourself where there's a wound. Once we fucking fix that, yeah, it changes the lanes, landscape of this situation going on right now. Yeah, it's money as soon as you see it for what it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really is. I mean, look, I think this uh, 
this life, I, I'm a big believer in life happening for you, not to you, right? And you can Absolutely. use these things that have happened to you in childhood trauma, because most of this is rooted in that. Almost <laughs> Putin's need to be in control is rooted in not having control and now. being and being literally <laughs> left as a child to always need attention. It's no different than any of these politicians. Look at the way Trudeau acts that need to be in control because he never had control in his life. Once you get a touch of power, that's what happens to the ego. It expands and it grows. And you see this everywhere. Yeah. So these are wounds. These are inner child wounds. That's, that's right. That's what you're seeing in the world. Inner that's child it. wounds. What if we teach people how to heal their inner child? What if we teach children in school? Hey, when you feel this, this is how you emotionally regulate, like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. What if we teach them when you get to a certain age, you're going to start to question are you, like your self-worth. Here's how you combat that. Here's how you start to watch mm -hmm. you walk through it. Here's the system, the processes. The world looks completely different. Like I'm, I'm not trying to teach my kids how to be great athletes and great. I'm trying to teach my kids right now. Hey, when you feel unworthy, here's some systems, here's some processes that you can do right. to combat that. So, right. yeah. That's it, man. But we can't, you know, that's why it's never taught in school, right? There's a stark right. reality when you compare a prison to a school in a side-by-side -side photo. Uh, side note, your son's principals don't like when you do that. Just letting you right. know. They don't love that. Um, but when the stark reality is in front of your face and you're able to see that there's a reason why things are done the way they're done, it is now on the parent to step in and say, we're going to reprogram this. We're going to do the That's work it. at home. And so you having children, how have yeah. you struggled with this outside world kind of coming in? Because our not to be super on your family, because I, I try to be very respectful, whether your kids are homeschooled or go to a, or go to a public school, you're going to get, a, a different v uh, version of a child. So based on that, how have you combated what it means when these children are not in your influence for eight hours a day? Yeah. So I, the foundation has to be laid at home, right? Like my, my son's 11 years old. He's in fifth grade. He's like the only kid in his school who doesn't have a cell phone. Right. Yes. A, it, oh my God. Like, Thank you. Like why? You don't need a cell phone right now. When we feel as though there's a need for it, then you can have it as long as you have the awareness that goes with it. Mm. So like my children, our children, me and my wife, we have to do the work on ourselves. Right. We have to do the work. And that's really the issue is that sometimes the children aren't getting what they need from the parents because the parents haven't done the work on themselves to expand their self-awareness, to fix their wounds. And they unconsciously project it on their child. So like, I'm very adamant about me understanding me. Because I know now I can better help my son, my daughter, how to better understand themselves. Mm. But it's it it goes back to me though. I can't teach you if I myself do not know. Mm. So I always tell parents, do the work, do the work on yourself, and make you a better parent and and be able to give them the foundation for what they need once they go out to the jungle. Mm -hmm. Like my parents had pretty high self-awareness. They still had some unconscious parts of them, but for the most part, they were pretty aware. That helped me once I went out into the world. Mm -hmm. I had the foundation laid. Right. You have the basics. When you have that foundation, anything can be built upon it. What has that been like <clears throat> in uh, in school systems in America with your children, though, too? Do you have them often come back and say, oh, this is what we're learning today? Yeah, I, it's that's the part where I probably struggle the most, like... Mm -hmm. It's when you have a certain level of awareness and you see what's going on. Mm. And it's like, do we still keep playing the game? Right. Or do we say like, you know what? No, nah, we're not going to do this. I'm from the the mentality of like, I could take you out of school. I could homeschool you. We could put you in this safe bubble, the safe environment. Right. But I want you to be able to like live in the jungle too. Right. right. You got you to gotta be able to be a house, house cat and you got to be able to be a lion. So that way you're ready for anything. Mm -hmm. So it's really just having those conscious, intentional conversations with our children say, hey, for this household, here's the standard. Here's the level of awareness that we'd like to hold ourselves to. Right. When you get your own house, you're welcome to do as you please. But right. under this then. roof, that, <laughs> until then, this is the way it is. And I always make sure, honestly, this was really hard based on how I was raised. I make sure I tell my kids, like, you don't have to do what I tell you. You don't have to. You don't. And that's hard with 11 year old son right now who can think for himself. Right. But I make sure I tell him like, you have a choice. I don't want him to grow up thinking he doesn't have a choice. That's what I grew up with. 
And now you mm -hmm. feel boxed in, you feel stuck. It's like, no, you have a choice, but no, if you go left or you go right, each one of those decisions is going to come with a consequence. As long as you're willing to deal with that, make the choice. Right. <laughs> my son said that to me yesterday, which was really funny. To, I was like, oh, I just heard myself come out of him. But it was this, uh, yeah, you can go do that. That's whatever. And he goes, there's always a consequence. And I was like, there is. I mean, there is. Yeah. And if you don't have to view it that way. But if you teach them that pathways can be easier or harder, but it, the right the right one might not always be the easy one, right? And so right. that's okay to know that. So when you're dealing with, you know, your children and, and, and how this works, what are some ways that you have found have been beneficial in getting people unstuck and keeping them out of that mindset of that? I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. I've been boxed in. I don't know how to move. Yeah. I always ask people, what would you do if you could do it for the rest of your life? What would it be? Mm -hmm. Not what's going to make you money. You don't need to worry about money. You don't need to worry about like, it's going to get you more followers or people going to listen to it. If you could figure out one thing that like I could do this all day long, what would it be? I had one client. She told me, she's like, I love folding laundry. And I looked at her. I'm like, okay, well, no judgment, but okay. Vibes, that's all right. <laughs> right. I'm like, so you could fold laundry all day long. She's like, I could literally do it like every day, all day. At the time she was uh, working at a chiropractic office. She's like, if I had my dream, I would be doing laundry all day. I'm like, okay. What? All right. So, no judgment. <laughs> right? How about this then? Let's figure out a way to do more of that. So she started going to her neighbors and saying, hey, I know you have four kids. I'll help you with your laundry on days yeah. that you, before she knew it, it ended up evolving into her like creating graphic t-shirts. Within a year and a half, she sold it. And she's wow. like, I'm good. Like, why? Because she followed her heart. So mm. when people feel stuck, it's because we're not following our heart because we're too much living in our head and the head has to make sense and needs to know where and needs to know when and knows how. And that's what keeps us stuck because I don't right. know how, I don't know when, I don't know where. So we won't move forward. So I always tell people, find what your heart is telling you and your heart always speaks through passions. Mm, that's that intuition, right? Here it is. Yeah. Yes. Talk, talk to me about this book because, uh, you know, you, 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 you went from a position in life where, I couldn't, I wouldn't have guessed you would have went into being an author. You know, I, I just, it's just normal transition. So yeah. talk to me about what that journey was like and why you felt you needed to put pen to paper. Yeah. So when I wrote, I wrote a book back in 2019, right? I was still under the like, kind of Christian paradigm, right? I was still, mm. and I was writing, it was a devotional, right? It was a devotional that was written um, as a way of therapy for me. When right. I was in the lowest time of my life, I would just sit here and write journal entries every day, every day. And I'd send it out to a couple of people and they're like, man, you need to publish this. This should be a book. I'm like, okay. So I had all of this hope, this faith, and I put it into this book, right? And so that's that. But then I'm actually in the process of self-publishing a book right now okay. that I haven't told anybody this. I'm actually going to say this for the first time, right? <laughs> it's the seven laws of healing our inner child. Oh, yeah. So like we got laws of the universe, you got laws of when Deepak Chopra had the laws of spiritual success. When you start understanding that there's always a process of framework, I'm realizing like, holy, sh like people have no yeah. idea if they knew the framework, they could work through everything. So right. that here will get released here in 2024. And that's why I'm doing it because I'm realizing what my life's work is it's oh, to help people this. remember. Yeah, it's I, I'll definitely send you a copy. It will. And yeah. it's simple. Like when you understand it now, like, oh, I'm on step five right now. I'm on law number five. I know what's coming next. I know what I need to do. It's literally like plug and play. I can take any issue that I have and apply these seven laws and I can start the process of healing and working through it. Isn't that amazing when you just show someone the path? Is it? Yeah. It's going to put a lot of therapists out of business. I, yeah. It's going to like, I, yeah. <laughs> Good. A lot of those people just push medication. If your doctor's not asking you, how do you sleep? What do you eat? What do you do for movement? They are a drug dealer. Right. Yeah. Wow. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Ain't that the no, truth. Right. I'm sorry. I've been, I've been on the other side of 11 different drugs for no goddamn reason. I know how wow. that feels. So I'm, I, I understand how important books like this are and how necessary 
they can be in teaching our youth how to move through things so that they don't have to wait till their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s after they've blown up marriages, ruined relationships, children don't want to speak to them. Like we can we can avoid pain. Yes. We can just avoid this shit. We don't we were have not to meant to suffer. In. No, we're yeah. not. No, we're yep. not. And it's that again, that devoiding yourself of responsibility. I, I I take aim at this one program. Um, and I know it saved a lot of lives. It saved a lot of my friends' lives, but I still take aim at it because I still have an issue with it. I have mm. an issue with the 12 step program. I do. I work mm. with a lot of recovering addicts and a lot of people who are stopping drinking and all of these types of behaviors for clients. And I've got to tell you, like the second they take that responsibility away from that person and put it onto something else. That is how you know it's going to take longer. Once an addict, always an addict is one of the worst sentences I have I've ever I've never heard. understood that. Yeah. I don't understand it. So you're telling yeah. me, that's like saying, this is truly what it's like saying, once a murderer, always a murderer. Right. Once, you know, once a deadbeat dad, always a deadbeat dad. Once a, once a broken soldier, always a broken soldier. You know, that, that idea that we can't heal. I don't know when that's, well, actually I do. I learned about that in school. Uh, when that started, when that came up, when that program was created, we were in a very different state. We were in a very yeah. different place of the world. And so we were only giving people the tools that we had, that we had at the time, but We've evolved since then, significant amounts so, from scientific right. perspectives to the way that the brain works to understanding the psyche. So to continually still state, once an addict, always an addict, and that I'm removing responsibility from self, that is why people relapse because they believe they can never heal, they're always yes. going to be broken, and that it's never going to be their responsibility. Yeah, no, it's, you're spot on with that. That I. I've heard that saying before. No, well, it's it's controversial because it it challenges tradition, the old paradigm. You know, the ego, the egoic mind does not like change. And that's most of us are living through our unconscious ego. So that's why we don't want to challenge like when we when you put it like that, it's like it's so obvious. Like, no, you have the ability to alchemize and transmute into a new being. Like everyone does. If your physical body can heal when it cuts itself, or when there's a cut, then emotionally and mentally, it would have yeah. to exist as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I just, wow. I, I really love your perspective on the world. And I can't state that enough. I often get emotional when I talk to people that I see are, are the real fucking deal. When they are mm -hmm. the people who have not learned it in a textbook, but felt it in their soul. And when yeah. you feel it and you have to walk the path. That path for a lot of people, and I'm sure you, there was points for you, is very lonely. Mm. And it is this, you know, I, I love this reference. And people, people like to bring it up or make it more philosophical. But as the great Snoop Dogg says, it is not my responsibility to come back down to you. If you mm. want to meet me, you need to meet me where I am at. And yeah. if you can't go it with me, then you can't go it with me, but I'll walk that bitch alone and I will get to the other side. You're welcome, yeah. but you got to do that walk as well. Yeah, that's that's the way I process it. I got to a point where I realized that this journey is going to be alone. Mm -hmm. But there's a letter that's missing. Mm -hmm. And the more that I can walk alone, I'll throw another L in there, which is love, mm -hmm. which is the acceptance of what is. And now when I throw that other L in there, it doesn't, it goes from being alone to all one, meaning I recognize that everything is working for me. Everything is trying to help me to expand. So now this journey, the hero's journey that I'm on, it seems like I'm alone, but I don't feel like I'm alone anymore because I realize that you and her and him, you were all just characters in my script, in my movie to help me to become aware of truly what I am mm -hmm. and stop falling for what I'm not. That's so right. I always tell people, when you feel alone, you're in a prime space for finding yourself because okay. you're never going to find yourself with somebody else or something else on the outside. It's going to be you being by yourself, feeling like you're alone, feeling like you're abandoned. This is actually the foundation for you to find yourself. Which is really funny. And I'm glad that you brought that up at the beginning where you're like, I got a babysitter to go sit alone. Humans mm -hmm. are no longer bored. Humans no longer have the opportunity to sit and think in quiet and peace. It's this 
hustle mentality. I think that you can have the hustle mentality. And I think you can also still care for yourself and give yourself space and grace to grow and give your time to allow these thoughts to actually have space to take form. But we're so quick to grab the phones. We're so quick to put the food. We're so quick to do the activity because we have FOMO. We're told we miss out. We do this. And so I really, I'm really glad that you said that, like, it's acceptable. Hire a babysitter. Go sit in the woods. Yeah. Yeah. No, like, I, I've, I gotta tell like a lot, I gotta tell my wife that I gotta tell a lot of mothers like, Oh yeah. <laughs> just because you have kids, that doesn't mean that you stop working on you and stop understanding you. Like you gotta take time to learn and know you, you know more about Taylor Swift than you do about yourself. Awesome. Get to know you, get to know you. And now once you know you, there's no better feeling when you know who you are. Cause you don't fall for the BS anymore of, of what you're not. So that's hard for people yeah. though, right? Because as soon as they realize that they, they have to, once they know who they are, that means the way they view the people around them shifts, which means things change percep- yeah. perspectives, cause families to change dynamics, to change views on the world, your friendship circle, what you tolerate, yeah. what you don't tolerate. Yeah. Yeah. And it's that's, a vibe. that's, that's the hard part of, Am I willing to let go of the old life for this new life? And a lot of people aren't. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, my friend. Well, look, dude, I want to have you back on if you'll have us. Uh, Absolutely. Okay. All right. Good. I want to have you back on. You let me know when you've done some medicine. And I want to hear about the journey on this. And I know a lot of my listeners will too, because these journeys are all so different. But they have so much to offer when we break it down and we allow others to come into our world. Um, Yeah. And so... Thank you, dude. Thank you for the vulnerability and willingness, the tools and the lessons you provided, but also showing us you can walk the path and come out the other side and be the best version of yourself, man. Thank you so much for that. Kelsey, I've, I've been on a lot of podcasts. I've done a lot of interviews and I'm not just saying this to say it. This is by far the best podcast that I've ever been on. Truly. Like, like you hold a space that makes it really easy for somebody to just be who they are. And that's a reflection as a testament to you doing your work on yourself. So Mm -hmm. from one soul to another, I appreciate you. I salute you for really you doing this work and being who you are. So thank you for having me on. And absolutely. When I get back, count me in. I am, I'm, I would, I would love to fill you in on it. Thank you. And any motherfucker out there that says you can't connect over a screen, you're just not doing it right. I'm telling you. (laughs) I felt those words. I didn't just, I didn't just uh, absorb them. I absorbed them. So thank you for that, my friend. All right. Well, you stick with me. Uh, Tell everyone before we go, where can they find you? How do they support you? Where do they get the book? Like, what do we do to uplift you? Yes. Thank you. I make it simple. Everything is at DG Mindset on social media. DG Mindset. Go to dgmindset.com. We got retreats coming up. Uh, We got a six month coaching program where, It's called Release, where I'm helping you to learn the framework of how to let go of the stuff that no longer serves you. Um, You can listen to the Pathway to Your Results podcast. That is my podcast, the Pathway to Your Results podcast. But I make it simple, dgmindset.com. You'll find everything there. We'll put everything in the show notes. You stick with me. Everyone else, we'll see you all next week.